<laughs> that would be great. So today's topic is biometrics, <laughs> as you know. And if you are ready, we can start. Mm -hmm. Again, we are going to follow a similar approach with our conversational AI. So first you'll mm -hmm. go in, do a sales kind of presentation, enablement, training, yeah. and then I'll go in and uh, talk about the product a little bit in details, the topologies, architectures, hardware, software. I'll finish it off with a demo. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. So let me make a quick start then. So uh, during my presentation, I will try to highlight some of the aspects that I'm highlighting during my presentation. So I will not treat you as the end customer. So I'm not just simulating a presentation. I will try to give you the hints basically, because in the end, these hints will guide you for the sales activity. So just to start with, uh, we always try to give an overall sense of conversational solutions before pitching biometrics directly, because in the end, as I also highlighted in my previous presentations, these technologies are converging. So if you can highlight that convergence, emphasize that, it will always give you an edge uh, and it will, it, you will be positioning in a different place in the customer's perception. So I think that's quite important. And for that, we always make an introduction. Of course, yeah, I mean, you can start talking about the vendor and its expertise. Expertise is quite important also for voice biometrics because, um, again, similar to our narration for the, for the conversational automation, the way you design that product, the, the way you position that product as part of the uh, customer's current security architecture, or the, the customer engagement or customer experience design is quite important. And it's, it, it will really contribute to success story. If, if you don't do it right, even if you have the best technology, uh, you will ha always have problems when it comes to voice biometrics technology. So even when you think about some of the success stories in the market versus some of the failed projects, you will always see that aspect of design. So it's always good to give two things, uh, the, the experience of the company and the vendor. So as a partner, maybe you won't have that experience. Maybe you cannot say, I have delivered this project five years ago and I have 10 customers, but that's okay. Uh, you can always use Sestex experience as part of your own experience because we will always be working hand, hand to hand with you guys. So um, I always highlight that because I'm trying to give this message, message to the customers. We know what security is. We know how sensitive this issue is. We have done this with financial institutions and telcos and even some, uh, you know, other, some government entities as well. So we know how sensitive this story is and we know that there are security requirements. We, we cannot like, we have to rely on KPIs. That's the message that you have to give from the very beginning. And then, I think Amit. even, yes, please. Uh, yes, please. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Can you click on the hide button on the page where it says stop sharing and next to it, it says hide? Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'll do Thank that. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this is the entrance sentence, you know, like uh, bringing together AI powered conversational solutions with high touch consultancy. The same goes for uh, biometrics as well. AI is on one side, high touch consultancy on, on the other side. So that's exactly what I stop typically. And I, I give that message to the, to, the, to the audience. And don't forget, there are always security guys in the audience. I mean, they, they, they are, I mean, they're, a whole KPI is maintaining the safety of their customers. So they will always have concerns. For example, whenever you say the equal error rate with voice biometrics is less than 5%, they will make it big in their mind. I mean, 5% for them is a big risk. Oh, what, are, what is this guy talking about? He's talking about the possibility of 5%. What is it? False acceptance, false rejection. What if some, someone is accepted falsely? What's going to happen? this and that. So you need to understand their psychology. So that's really a key issue. So that's why I start emphasizing uh, our experience as a vendor. Guys, we have done this before. We empathize with your concerns. We know what type of sensitivities you, you might have. And yes, we know it. And that's how we handle uh, the, the way we handle those concerns is the high touch consultancy and the know-how. Uh, and after this introduction, of course, we start to give some idea about the overall portfolio of the vendors. Again, for example, just to give you a solid example, if you're trying to sell this voice biometrics to a financial institution, and if you're going to uh, make it on the IVR, then it's a very good idea to bundle it with conversational IVR. So imagine you're saying, I'd like to learn my balance, my voice, my password. And now you, you don't even need to say my voice, my password by passive authentication. But for passive authentication, you need to get some, some type of input, right? So on the IVR, you cannot say to the customer, please, can you speak with me for some seconds so that I will authenticate you? 
this is not a viable thing. You will either, either make a, f f a fake prompt, like, please say, uh, my telecommunications company is the best company in the world. And he will say that, but actually it will be, it will not look at what he says. I mean, he just, the system just needs some speech, right? Uh, so this scenario is like, it will look like an active scenario. So active biometrics is like my voice, my password. But let's say you, you, you want to sell passive. So you want to sell passive, but you need to get some input and you want to do it on the IVR. With conversational IVR, you already do that. So uh, the, the way you position the product, even if the customer is not interested in conversational IVR at that moment in time, you can always generate an impression that, look, you know, you have, you, you have this today, but we can expand with this one so that the bundle will make much more sense and will deliver much bigger value for your customers. So this is always important. Even for the, uh, for example, um, conversational automation, conversational biometrics, and we have conversational analytics as well, right? So how is how are those two related? They are very much related because if the customer is focused on fraud detection or fraud, he wants to enhance his fraud management system, you can say, look, you can do fraud detection using passive authentication in the background, and you can also use real-time conversation analytics to capture the keywords as well because fraudsters have typical ways of speaking and they have standard scenarios. You can combine voice biometrics with keyword detection and you can have a bundle fraud detection tool. And now actually with Sestec AI, we can even detect fraud using AI technology based on the speech content. So when we say biometrics, it's about signal processing. But we can also introduce the concept of the content of the speech to tell them, look, today you're going to have this technology. And for that technology, for passive authentication, for example, you will be streaming that call. You will be doing a streaming, right? And for using the same streaming, you can also do real-time speech analytics as well, real-time keyword detection as well. So again, the strategy here is just to show the customer the richness of the solutions and the fact that we can understand their requirement and actually we have more to offer specific to that requirement. And I think that's a good sales strategy, which convinces a lot of people. Even from the beginning, you start, you know, uh, eliminating a lot of competitors, even if you don't realize uh, by that time when you give all those information. And then these are some of the, these are like the, some basic list of the products under each group. Uh, and you will also be surprised, like they will come to you as voice biometrics. And then you will say, okay, this is active. This is passive. This is blacklist identification. This is uh, verification on the go. And then suddenly you will realize that actually they're, they're interested in most of your portfolio. So it's always to show a snapshot of this. But now let me go uh, after, of course, giving some of the differentiators of the company. And so let me go into the uh, product part now because I don't have much time. So I, I want to just uh, highlight some of the key points about the products. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, this is my big advice to you. This is the, I think this is the top hints of this presentation. Voice biometrics technology requires a certain level of uh, technical explanation capability. So, for example, you need to clarify what an active authentication is, what a passive authentication is, what is the difference between authentication and identification. For example, active authentication is typically uh, people remember my voice and my password. That's true. So when, when you ask the customer to say my voice is my password, then this is active. If the authentication is done during the natural conversation, this is called passive. Passive has two versions. One is verification on the go. This is a brand name, actually. This is authentication solution. And the other one is blacklist identification. This is the identification solution. How we differentiate these two? Verification verifies someone against their claimed identity. So don't forget this word, claimed identity. So for you to verify me or authent authenticate me, you need uh, first, I need to have a claimed identity. So I will, I will call the contact center and say, I claim to be Ahmed. And this is my caller ID. This caller ID is the claim that I am the owner of that caller ID, right? Now I'm proving this by saying either my voice, my password, or just speaking naturally. So I have a claim identity, and my speech is compared against the voice print, which is attached to that claimed identity. So this claimed identity already have a voice print. And now I'm saying my voice, my password, or I'm speaking, is compared against this one. It's a one-to-one -one match. But let's say I'm speaking and then, you know, uh, the system says, okay, this guy be a, can be a fraudster. There's a risk. So he's not matching with his voice or there are some other additional security factors that uh, creates a warning. Okay, this guy is probably a fraudster. 
then using identification, you can check whether this voice belongs to one of the previously saved fraudsters. Because if there's a fraud case and if there is an accessible recorded file for that fraud case, you can generate a voice signature for that fraudster. Let's say fraudster number one has a voice print. And now I'm speaking and this is okay, this guy doesn't match his own voice. So let me check now who this guy is. So now this is the identification. This is one to N match. So for example, these are some of the simple things that you need to explain over and over because you will be surprised to see that like, even if you explain three times, the fourth time you will receive a question and you will realize that they didn't still get it because it's a bit confusing, right? So that's one thing. Second, the equal error rate. I'm sorry, but you have to understand this. I will leave this to Anul, but even if you're a purely non-technical sales guy, there is no escape. And I can tell you one of the reasons why the solution is not all over because sales guys couldn't explain this. <laughs> because these are so crucial to the salespeople, uh, to, the, to the audience, and there's a security guy there. They can rule you out in just one speech. They say, okay, no, we're not going to get to that. This is very risky. No one will get the risk. And they will see some examples uh, of bad design in which the customer took that risk and they failed for some reason. There was a scandalous situation, things like that. That's why I told you always give this convenience to the customer by telling that you have already done this, this and deployed this, especially mention the regional references. For me, the first, uh, you know, voice biometrics in Kuwait, the first passive authentication in the whole Gulf, the first telco in the Gulf region, the first telco in the Africa, these are my references. Uh, the, the, I think the second, but the, I think the only successful implementation in UAE, uh, the first in Saudi, things like that. I always tell these things, uh, but that, that's the core reason. Um, also, you need to be very careful, even in the first pitch, whenever you talk about equal error rate, be careful and try to explain that. Voice biometrics, imagine this. You have, let's say, multi-factor authentication architecture. Multi-factor authentication. You also need to learn that because... Uh, if you go to a financial institution and if you start saying, okay, voice biometrics, you can use it and you can replace all the rest of the security measures. You don't need pins. You don't need... This is not uh, correct. In the context of financial institutions, you have to pitch uh, voice biometrics as, as part of the overall custom, uh, overall um, uh, security architecture. And it has to be multi-factor. It cannot be single factor. So when you say multi-factor authentication, there are three uh, dimensions, possession factor, um, uh, biometrics factor and knowledge factor. So possession is something that you should have, like a token, like uh, like a SIM card. You need to have the SIM card, right? Second, uh, information factor. You, you need to know something. The third, biometrics factor. So you need to combine these three. And you have to say this. If your concern is security, with voice biometrics, your security can only be better. There is no way it can be worse. So if you have two of these, you can add voice biometrics on top of them and it, be, it will become much stronger. But what we typically tell is, look, you, you don't want to compromise customer experience and you, you want to have savings, right? So you need to combine these two logic. For example, in the IVR, if the customer selects an option which does not require that high level of security, so say, I'm, I'm going to ask my balance, right? You can combine caller ID with voice biometrics and it's good enough. It will even convince the uh, most like staunch uh, security guy. So he will be convinced. But if you're, I'm always giving this, if you're going to transfer $1 million to, to your colleague, uh, then, of course, you have to go with caller ID, uh, information questions like PIN number plus voice biometrics. So what we do is we have a blended design, and you can also play with the threshold to minimize the risk of false acceptance. What is a threshold? You know, voice biometrics is a comparison, right? And the result is a probability. So it's a stochastic thing. So it's not like one or zero. So if you increase the threshold, threshold means, for example, you have your voice print here and you have the sample. If when the comparison outcome is, let's say, 90%, is it good enough or not? This is a subjective criteria. It's not subjective, but like what happens if you make it 90 or 95? So if you increase the threshold, there is such a minimal risk that the system will accept you, although you are the wrong person. Uh, so you're minimizing risk. But what is the flip side? you're increasing the risk of false false uh, rejection. For example, I can be rejected all the time the right person. But what if you increase the threshold? And if I fall into the gray area, then you ask one more question. You ask my birth date. You ask my, um, you know, uh, Emirates six, last six digits of my um, account number, something like that. 
then it will cover for that. So I, I'm not expecting you to go into these details, but what I'm trying to say is listen to Anil carefully. And there are certain, I mean, you can just listen to this uh, video as well. There are a couple of things that you, you need to know. The differentiation between passive and active, multi-factor authentication, what it means, what are its you know, uh, you know, types. And then what is this uh, uh, threshold and how we design uh, differently so that we fit into the customer's requirements. So if you can overcome this boring part, then you have a ready audience, their arms opened, all their existential dilemmas are sold. You know, now they're open for your sales, right? Then after you can just say, you know, this company used that, that company used that. I'm always giving references and examples, the return and investment. You can give more details about the product like you're seeing here. So I don't, I don't think I need to go through them. Like I, I sometimes mention the additional security uh, features that we have like IES encryption, uh, you know, things like brute force attack, you know, type of thing, you know, what type of measures we get against that, things like that. You just go through that list and it will further give them convenience about the product. And then, of course, I I, I start telling about whether they need like a verification on the go, the, the passive one or the active one, what are the differences, what are the use cases. But just to summarize this part, today the big trend, trend is the passive authentication. Why? Previously, passive authentication took long to authenticate you could you should have let's say 30 seconds or minimum seven seconds of speech until you authenticate something some, someone to a, to a, a agreeable degree okay nowadays the technology is advanced and it can recognize you even with a very high accuracy with two three seconds of speech now because of this fact we can also use the same tool on the ivr why because on the ivr what type of speech can happen on the ivr right you can only ask for a like you can also prompt you can only prompt the customer to say something, but it will be one sentence, right? You cannot say, "Oh, uh, can you tell me about your day today?" You cannot ask this on the IVR, right? You can you, you can either mimic active authentication, say, "Please say uh, my company hears me from my voice," and you say, "My company hears me from my voice," or if you have a conversational IVR, you can you can just say, "Please let us know which service you want to get." I'd like to learn my balance. Okay, uh, you know, then if the input is very short, maybe you can ask for one more thing to be said on the IVR, then you can authenticate. So the beauty of this is, this is language agnostic. Uh, you can also continue the authentication with the agent as well. So you have more data, you can make another round of warning, like you can send a notification. Uh, and it saves you time, project management cycle, cycle is much uh, less. So this is the big trend now. Uh, verification on the, the passive authentication. Because of the advancement of the technology, it can recognize you even on the IVR with a one sentence or a couple of sentences maximum. And this can be designed. No need for background modeling as much as we do uh, for the active uh, authentication. Uh, we just made a demo to one of our customers in Africa. They uh, authenticate, We authenticated us using their English speech and then they uh, turned to another language, an African language, a native language and it's recognized them perfectly. This is the big advantage. So the big trend is verification on the go. And I know at least one very large customer who's trying to replace their active authentication with a passive one. So you can see the trend from here. So I'm coming to an end. I know it was a fast one, but these are the key points. I mean, like for a use case, you can always go through our use cases. There are a lot of banks around and uh, there are a lot of return investment, especially, this is my last big hint for this session, Please try to understand how they authenticate, even if you can before the meeting. If they're asking questions, then you have a big, big, big advantage to convince those guys because it takes a lot of time and then you're removing that duration and the savings are very obvious. If they are not doing any type of uh, explicit agent-based authentication, even if they are doing it like by, a, sometimes the agent routes them to an IVR and they, they do the authentication and they go back to the agent. Even in that case, it means they're consuming the agent's duration because if I route you to an agent, I have to wait for you, right? When you come back, you have to find me, right? So that duration is a lost duration. It's, it's the average handling time. So you have to keep the agent uh, occupied because of the authentication. So to shift all the authentication to the IVR, you need to really make sure that you can apply multi-factor authentication. And there are very smart ways of doing that. By the way, before forgetting, you can also use technologies like ASR to enhance that security architecture. Imagine I'm calling uh, the, a telco, like a bank. Uh, I say, uh, the caller ID comes. This is the first possession factor. It comes automatically. You don't need to do anything like If I'm calling from a registered number, security number one. Then I'm, I'm saying, I'd like to uh, you know, top up. I'd like to buy new data package. 
let's say we have passive authentication and my voice is recognized. And then uh, if, let's say, I fall on the gray area, the system can say, please tell us your uh, last four digits of your registered number or your birth date. You say 1981. You can combine these three, and as you can see, and most of the cases, the system will not ask for your birth date because the voice uh, accuracy will be good enough. But in, the, in this case, you have used two speech technologies and a caller ID, and you have done everything on the IVR, and it's, it's a very sound way of doing that. There are different alternatives as well, but in the end, the purpose, if you understand the customer requirement, if you feel that they are after efficiency, you should give examples from the IVRs, because on the IVR, you can get rid of uh, consuming uh, agents' time, which means savings for them. So please try to focus on use cases, which focuses on handling all the authentication on the IVR without compromising the multi-factor authentication. Because you might you might feel that you're coming coming up with a bright idea, saying, "Oh, you can only do voice biometrics, and all the authentication will be done." Like our poor friends uh, from a bank in in my region, which went with one of our competition, and they pitched it that way. And the guys are trying to get rid of the solution for the last four years. Why? Because they realize that there's a big security gap. It's not a good way of design. They're missing some of the you know, details, which are quite important. In the end, they're trying to get rid of it. But if you put it right, the return investment is high. The security concerns are met. You have a potential customer to win. Okay, so this is uh, one of the largest telco implementations in the whole region. Uh, for my region, the Middle East and Africa, I have done the first telco in Africa. I have done the first telco in uh, in the Middle East, in Lebanon. Uh, first telco, uh, first bank in Kuwait, first uh, ever uh, passive authentication uh, from for a financial industry for the whole region. And uh, we have more than uh, 12 banks, so uh, you can always use those references. ING is just one of them. And Denny's Bank is another one of them. And these are our partners. And in the end, like just to enhance the uh, the, the impression and the uh, you know confidence on the side of the customers, we also mentioned our partnerships, global partnerships, and some of the uh, customers we work with from different verticals. And that's it. So uh, sorry, it was a fast one, but I, I just said 15 minutes. I think I'm already exceeding uh, by eight minutes. I hope it was a useful session. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank or Anil, it's over to you. Thank you, Ahmed. I think it was great. Let me share my screen just to take over. Okay. <clears throat> so this part is mostly pre-sales. So I'll just talk about a little bit of technical details. As I said, let's look at the product in detail. I know Ahmed covered most of it and it was a great summary, but the voice biometrics technology, you know, uh, is divided into three in, in SESTEC at least. The first one is an active biometrics. As Ahmed said, it uses an active voice uh, vocal passphrase and the vocal passphrase can be anything, like it could be the my voice is my password as the standard in the industry, or it could be like my company knows me from my voice and that company word can be changed into the brand name of the organization. Well, uh, the active biometrics, as you will see in a few slides, is slowly fading out. The reason is, uh, People don't want to say the passphrase. They don't want to lose any time. They just want to speak naturally, either with the IVR or with the agent. So that's why the second type of biometrics is the verification on the go. Okay, so that is passive biometrics. You don't actively say a passphrase. You just say whatever the reason that you're calling for, and the system takes your voice, compares it with your voice print, and then you are verified or not verified as the genuine owner of the account. And the last one is an identification problem. Now, uh, a lot of companies are asking for blacklist identification. So we focus on the blacklist part of it because identification in itself is actually finding a speaker among thousands of other speakers, right? In the blacklist identification, what you do is you actually uh, have a blacklist, meaning that there are people who committed fraud and the organization actually has their voices on file. They may not know who they are, like they don't, they may not know their first name and last name, but if they have it on file, then they already have their voice recordings. So you can create a blacklist and then compare every single caller 
against the blacklist to identify if the caller is one of the uh, people in the in the fraud list and then you can notify the agents or or whoever is interested in that call okay so these three types actually share the same feature set okay don't look at the title here vocal passphrase we actually share them amongst all of our biometrics uh, technologies so what are those voice print adaptation just recently an rfp came and it was asking can you change the voice print okay uh, uh, over time and yes we can do that what the system does what the system does is it takes the latest successful authentication attempt and it uses to modify the voice print on file the reason being is okay it's not because we are getting old and our voices are changing dramatically but maybe the environment may, might be changing so people might be uh, actually calling from a very quiet office uh, before covid and now they're calling in their homes and there are a lot of you know dogs barking kids crying in the background so there might be some noisy environment and the system has to adapt to those changes that's why the voice print adaptation is one of them the second is there's a threshold like ahmed mentioned for the success or the efficiency of the product the false reject and false acceptance rates can be easily changed the threshold can be easily changed so the system can either become more strict or it could become a little bit more flexible and one thing with biometrics uh, that either the sales or the pre-sales people should uh, keep in mind is that you know the risk factor derives how much you let the people you know uh, do some wrong i mean uh, someone can actually gain access to someone else or how much you reject the genuine owner of an account so the risk factor means that someone might be asking for their balance which is a read-only information right you just tell them your balance is 300 dollars. so there, maybe there is not much risk in that transaction so your threshold level can be lower compared to another transaction where i'm sending ahmed a million dollars okay where i never sent any money to Ahmed before. So that's a very high risk transaction and you have to have the threshold level really high so that the system may even reject me as the owner of the account, but most of the time, it's also not gonna let any fraudsters to, to gain access into my account to do that kind of transaction, okay? So configuring the threshold levels is extremely important. Now, one thing that we do in active biometrics is because there is a vocal passphrase someone needs to say we use speech to text to to check that the people really said the, the vocal passphrase correctly so that, that's what content control is okay then the next one is signal to noise ratio calculation well whenever you receive a call and you send it to our biometric service the biometric service what it's going to do is it's going to check the noise levels and then if the noise level is not accepting is not in an acceptable range it's going to notify the client in this case it could be the ivr that uh, voice biometrics is not reliable because of excess noise so maybe a fallback mechanism where the agents are asking the security questions might be better uh, in that in that case now we covered the first four of them the next items are mostly about fraud prevention okay so people might be changing their uh, voices by handing the phone to someone else in the middle of the conversation so there is voice change detection both in active and the passive biometrics and then there is liveliness detection meaning that the voice where you know uh, the system checks should not be a recorded voice so there is a synthetic voice detection where uh, people may try to you know uh, commit some fraud and the system can catch those attempts and then there are others like playback detection this is mostly for internal fraud attempts let's assume you're an employee of a bank and you gain access to the voice print okay so if you try to use that same voice print to authenticate an account the system will say hey this is a playback okay this is the same exact record that is being used in during the enrollment because that's the voice print file so it cannot be used the other one is brute force attack so let's say today i'm bored and i'm calling the bank okay so the first time i call it asks me an account number 
I enter an account number, which I don't know. Okay, I, I just make it up. I try to gain access using voice biometrics. I fail. I hung up. I call again, this time trying another account number. I fail. The third time I called, the system is going to uh, actually notify that there is someone on the other end of the phone who is trying to gain access to different accounts and failing. That's when the system can say, hey, this might be a brute force attack and it notifies the authorities, okay? So there are some measures in the biometric services which you will see in the RFPs mostly, but uh, what you will get out of this webinar is that, okay, yes, there is really some, some measures that Cestec Biometrics is actually taking towards you know, achieving the most secure uh, biometric service, okay? The passive biometrics shares the same features, but on top of it, it's language agnostic. So as Ahmed said, and on my file, I have my enrollment record in English and I can try the authentication in Turkish. As long as it's me speaking, it doesn't care what I'm saying. So the passive biometrics is language agnostic and it just cares about how long I speak, which I will share you in a minute why the duration actually makes sense. So the blacklist, I already mentioned about the blacklist. Now, you remember I said the active biometrics is slowly fading out and leaving its space to passive biometrics. And this is just like one of the you know slides that summarizes. So back in the time, and this took telecom was, I guess, 10 years ago, there was only active biometrics, right? So people start using it. And then slowly, the financial industry started to pick up. So that is actually a very important step because all of our kind of, uh, you know, environment, they were saying, hey, the banks are not going to adapt this technology because, you know, it's a biometrics technology. But what we have seen is they adapted not only voice biometrics, but also the fingerprint, some iris detection, you know, face detection technologies. So the banks are adapting, which means that there is a no more limit of this technology in terms of customer adaptation. So slowly, it goes into the verification on the go. And this slide is just representative of many other customers, but uh, just the recent technology uh, user is ING Bank. And before that, a very large telco in Turkey, it's Turkcell. And what uh, the last time we checked, there were already close to 600,000 voice prints created on the, on the system. Now, I wanted to share this slide with you for one reason you may or your customers may ask, okay, but how do you actually uh, enroll people and authenticate people using passive biometrics? And this is an use case from ING Bank. What they do is when the customer calls the contact center and starts talking with an agent, the voice recording starts, okay? So the first thing the system will check is comparing that customer's voice to the voices in the blacklist because that's the first thing that you should be doing, you know, to prevent any fraud attempt. Now, if it comes back negative, then what you do is you actually record the entire conversation. And if this customer is not enrolled into the biometric system, at the end, the customer might be asked a question saying that, by the way, can we, dear customer, can we use this uh, recording as your enrollment you know recording as the way to to enroll you into the system and the customer says yes so then this call is being used uh, just to create a voice print on the file well the next time they call the system is going to understand that hey the customer already has a voice print so this time it's not about enrollment but it's about the authentication piece so immediately after it authenticates it's going to notify the agent uh, the the verification result okay now the question that you may be having if you are technical in this webinar is how do you use the biometric system and the and the customers will ask okay but how do we integrate it with our systems now that client can be an IVR or it could be the contact center agent it could be the mobile application it doesn't really matter for us because we provide the technology as an API okay as long as the customer or as you the partner has an API connectivity kind of enablement or capability, you could use the biometrics features. The other one is the anti-fraud. 
which I mentioned. The other one is reliability. So the next slide, I'll talk about the reliability uh, factor. Now, the only channel is really important because what we we have been seeing is that uh, the companies are offering their biometric solutions on different channels. I'll give you one example, very recent example, a large bank in Turkey. They have voice biometrics on IVR. What they want to do is they want to implement the same biometrics technology on their mobile application. So instead of using the password to get into the mobile application, people will use voice biometrics. Now, can they use the voice print which were created on their IVR to authenticate the people on their mobile application? The answer is yes, okay? So the convergence of channels into a single voice print is, is very important. And the other one is, the last one is the scalability. Okay, the Turk Telecom example, we have close to 4 million voice prints on file. There are probably around 30, 40 million subscribers, so there's still room to grow, even though it's been 10 years, the number of voice prints are increasing. So the system can be scaled horizontally, you know, by adding more resources, more, more hardware. Okay. Now, this is the latest results from a lab, and since we are going to share this presentation with you afterwards, you will be able to, you know, re re kind of uh, refer to this slide. What we did is we used two different models, one for telephony model, one for the microphone. The microphone model is usually used on like mobile channels because uh, you have the microphone of your smartphone and the telephony model is used on the contact center. And then we tested the solution using different durations of enrollment versus authentication. Okay, at this point, I think it's, it's a good reminder that the longer the duration of speech, the better the accuracy of the models will be. But the technology, as you will see here, is actually letting us have a very good error rate, okay, or a good accuracy rate, whenever, uh, even though the duration of enrollment and authentication drops all the way to three seconds. If I were to do this webinar maybe a couple of months ago, and I'm not kidding you, just two months ago, I never would have mentioned that our passive biometric system works in a three second enrollment and three second authentication uh, environment. At least I had to say at least 40 seconds for enrollment and 10 seconds for the authentication piece to have a good error rate, right? But so far we have been seeing very good results using the short utterances and and I'm not talking in a sales pitch. I'm not talking in a marketing kind of material. I'm just saying it from a technical perspective that the short utterances, even the short utterances on IVR are now resulting in very good results. I'll give you one example. If you call and say on a conversational IVR, which was the topic of our previous uh, webinar, if you say, hey, I'm calling to increase my credit line. Th this three second utterance will be enough to authenticate you on your voice, okay? So uh, the technology is, like Ahmed said, is converging. So it's becoming a one biometric system for both IVRs and the contact centers or mobile applications. So uh, now the state of the art is actually letting us do that. Okay. Now these are the differentiators and I think it's a good point to stop the presentation here and talk about little bit more technical details. Okay, this is the probably the most complicated one. This is the passive biometrics. Uh, the passive biometrics, the reason why it's being complicated is because we need to have a streaming server. We need to get the stream, uh, the customer channel stream onto our biometrics services, right? So if you're doing it within a contact center environment, so when the customer are speaking with an agent, then what you need to do is actually you need to stream just the customer end of it, okay? So this is why you have a media gateway, a PBX, there's a CTI, there's a streaming server, which streams the, the information and the RTP packages onto our biometrics services, okay? Then there is the rest of the stuff on the right-hand side where the biometric services are using, you know, the licenses, the biometric storage, the voice prints. There's a database, which is a Microsoft SQL database to, to check, okay, does this customer have a voice print? Yes or no. 
If it's yes, then I have to do an authentication. If it's a no, I have to do an enrollment, right? Kind of thing. And then how do you actually notify an agent when uh, with the result of your verification, you have to do it through the integration. Okay, so we can provide some SDKs to our customers or again an API so that they can actually embed it within their own agent desktop application. That's what ING Bank did. Okay, instead of installing another client onto the agent PCs, they just embed it within the uh, agent desktop application that they are using. Okay, so the second one is our active biometrics, which is much, much, much more, you know, simpler. There is the client, which is, let's say, an IVR, okay? And you have your two services here. Because of redundancy, you can actually have, you know, one, two, up to N different uh, clusters. And within each cluster, you can have like a front side service, which is talking, you know, uh, and then uh, the analysis service, which is actually doing the biometrics piece, okay? So in the background, the system is again the same. There is a database, a Microsoft SQL database, and then there is a storage to store the voice print securely, which is IES-256 algorithm is encrypting all the voice by all the voice prints, sorry. And then since I talk about a lot of passive biometrics, if you wanna see, if you wanna use it on your presentations, we can share with you an IVR scenario of active biometrics, okay? And in the active biometrics, as you can see, everything starts with a has voice print kind of question. If you don't, it's an enrollment. If you do, it's an authentication. So then you can actually see how the flow actually goes in an enrollment. You have to do it three times. So the customer has to say, my voice is my password three times. In the authentication piece, it's only one time, okay? So there is this kind of uh, sample flow that you could actually share with your customers. Next on the list, I know we are so excited to see our hardware software documents as our partners. Um, this is from the passive biometrics, okay? So I just wanted to give you one example. Now, there are some assumptions here which could change, by the way. The first assumption is the enrollment should be at least 60 seconds and then the authentication piece should be uh, around 10 seconds, okay? And then with these assumptions, you can just ignore the other data for now, the below server can support up to 400 concurrent requests or 400 ports, okay? So what is the below server? The below server is this one. There are four cores on the CPU, 16 gig on the application server, right? And, uh, uh, and a little bit of uh, hard disk space. Well, the reason why I wanted to share this example is because it's not a resource hog. It's not gonna require a lot of you know, resources on the customer side, right? And uh, we are still a Windows, uh, Microsoft shop. So we need a micro, uh, Windows server as the operating system. And we are developing our tools using the .NET, right? So uh, we will be actually, Actually, switching this technology with at the end of this year, going through the DevOps transformation, where it will be, you know, uh, Linux based and the database will be PostgreSQL. But for now, uh, let's stick with the Windows and the VMs that we require from the customer. So you may ask, can we provide it on the cloud? The answer is yes. We could actually provide it in a SaaS fashion. All we need to do is we need to learn the, you know, whatever the number of concurrent requests will be in the customer. And then they will just get an API endpoint from the cloud and they can integrate with it. So that is also possible, okay? So a lot of different options are available, but I know in the RFPs, most of the questions are around you know, API capabilities and the equal letter rates, like Ahmed mentioned, how secure is the system? The how secure is the system, I think it deserves a little bit of explanation, but uh, I would prefer showing you the demo, you know, to, to show you how secure the system is. Now, as the pre-sales, you may be asking, how do I show my customers that the system is working and it's secure? And in my opinion, the best way to prove the system is sharing the demo numbers with the customers or during a session in a live session they could call 
our demo number and try it themselves. Okay, so <clears throat> the way that you rep you present it to the customers is through a web interface. This is a reporting interface. Excuse me. So what you do is you can show them all the operations on the web interface, and there is even more like the statistics, and there is the numbers, how many users enrolled, how many users authenticated themselves. So if I click on the enrollment statistics and pick last quarter, this is a demo system and it was just refreshed last week. So, so far there were only 14 people who enrolled into the system. If there were, I was going to see the noisy, the voice changes, the incorrect content, all of that on, on the statistics, right? And then authentication must be more than 14. Let me select last quarter. There were 21 attempts and 18 of them were accepted. Three of them were rejected, okay? So this demo system and this interface, you know, can be used to show the customer how the biometrics is working. One example, my user code in the system is 10172. So before coming into this webinar, I called our IVR, the demo number, which I will share with you, and I enroll into the system, meaning that I spoke 20 seconds. So for now, we set the enrollment to 20 seconds and authentication to five seconds. So you can click on this one, and what you can say is, okay, I want to listen to the enrollment record of Anil, okay? So if you listen, it's, it's going to play. You can actually delete the signature, so I, don't, I have to re-enroll into the system, or you can suspend it, okay? In some cases, especially banks are using it, okay? If there is any fraudulent activity or any suspicious activity, you can suspend the voice print of that particular customer for a while, so the customer has to go through the security questions that the agents will ask, you know, until the agent is satisfied that, okay, this is the genuine owner, they just maybe had a bad day or they, they gave the phone to their wife and, uh, and husband, they tried to authenticate, it wasn't a fraudulent attempt, so then you can come here and you can make that uh, signature available. Okay. And then, so I showed you the users, I showed you the statistics. This is the operations. This is the heart of the reporting interface. This is where you get to see every single result whether it's, uh, it resulted in a successful or not so successful uh, verification or the enrollment. As you can see, there was the enrollment record that was done uh, previously and then an authentication record as well, okay? So as you do demos, this system is going to be updated. And let's look at one of the results here. It says accepted high confidence. So instead of showing a score out of you know 100, we tell you, or the customers whether the system accepted the caller you know and with what what kind of confidence if it's high confidence you can be assured that the score is 90 or more okay meaning that it's a very reliable result and maybe the risk factor if it's not extremely high you can rely on the biometric results solely so you don't have to ask any security questions if it were let's say medium confidence where is my medium confidence i don't see it uh, maybe on the second page well then the score is not as high as you would like to be but it's still accepted meaning that there is a high chance it's the genuine owner of the call uh, of the account owner but if there's a high risk transaction then you may not wanna you know proceed without asking any security questions okay so the demo numbers, I'll share with you the demo instructions because as pre-sales, you may want to do the demos and then uh, show your customers the results here. But uh, let me actually make a live demo while you're here. I'll call my IVR number. Okay, now <clears throat> one more thing. In a real contact center environment, when you do passive biometrics, you're actually speaking with a live agent, right? The agent says, hey, how are you? Can I learn the reason of your call? And then you just start speaking with an agent. In the demo, since there is no live agent on the other side of the phone, what we did is a silent agent, meaning that our own IVR is gonna pick up the phone and it's gonna tell us to speak. 
And once I speak enough, meaning that for enrollment, it's 20 seconds, and for authentication, it's five seconds, the IVR is going to tell me, okay, you have spoken enough. Now I'm going to do either the enrollment or the authentication, and it's going to announce me the result. Okay. So that's what you're going to be hearing in a minute. Your user code is 10172. Voice print verification will happen in the background as you speak. Please start talking. <laughs> Hello, my name is Anil. I'm doing a webinar on voice biometrics, and this is a live demo. So after I speak, it should verify. Your voice print is verified. Okay. Please press 1 to so it was my own voice, you know, so the system actually verified that it's me. And uh, within a short moment, I need to get the result here. Okay. So it's 3.51 p.m. here in Turkey. I get to see the 3.51 result here. The user code is 10172. The system accepted me with high confidence, right? So <clears throat> you could show them or you could make them kind of listen to the authentication attempt uh, in this case. I don't know if the webinar is going to relay the sound. I could hear that, but probably you couldn't because I didn't share the sound. But anyway, so this is how you do a real uh, kind of demo. And what I encourage you to do is ask them to do the demo, ask the customer especially in the passive biometrics, if they can speak more than one language, ask them to enroll in uh, in one language and then do the authentication in, in the other language, just to show them the system is secure and it's language agnostic and the results are here on the screen. So uh, I think it's a it's an effective way of, of showing them the demo, uh, the, the power of the system. Okay. So let me stop sharing my screen. Ahmed, are you with us? Did I make you put, did I make you sleep? No, 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 I'm here. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Actually, I was done. Is there any question on the chat window? Probably not. Well, that kind of wraps up our, our webinar on biometrics. Is there anything else you want to say, Ahmed? Uh, no, no, I think that was a good session. Thank you very much. I think Thank the demo you. is very important. I think we, we, all of our partners here should focus on the demo, which will mm -hmm. make it the definitive, uh, you know, change in the customer's perspective. perspective. Uh, as we observed in our last engagements in the Africa, um, that really had a lot of, you know, positive effect on our, uh, you know, uh, in increasing engagement with those uh, companies because I mean, without going into any discussion, they could just test it during the meeting and they could see that it worked in the, with the local languages. So this okay. gives a lot of confidence to customers. So I think each of our partners here should be capable of doing this test. Uh, and uh, I also suggest them to think about the test scenarios, like who will test what, and then uh, the, the scenario of the demo itself. Like I will test first and I'll try to access my friend's account and he will try to access my account. And we yeah. will ask one, one person from the audience to try it. So if they follow that pattern, I think uh, that they can uh, get a lot of traction for this tool. Any partner who's watching this, you know, even live or, or later, we could practice this together, like Ahmed said, before you go in front of a customer. And then, like Ahmed said, because it's important, okay, I'm the genuine owner of the call uh, of the account, maybe you're not. So we do a cross kind of test and that that needs to be scripted before going uh, you know in front of a customer so that's a good point okay well thank you everyone and thank you to the audience here ahmed thank you thank and you Anil. thank you later thank you bye bye thanks a lot bye bye